All right. So I'm going to start by talking about one of the things that I didn't finish talking about last time, which is the issue about strict versus numerical universality. Um, so, um, hold on a second. Could you keep it down a little bit? Thank you. Sorry. Um, so this issue of strict versus numerical universality um, Okay, let me introduce it this way. So Popper says it doesn't matter what concepts you use. It matters just matters whether you use them in statements that are falsifiable. And um, I want to uh, stop and go over that distinction between concepts and statements or propositions because I feel like from some of the questions I've been getting uh, um, relative to the midterm that um, that has never really been clear, at least to some people. Um, and uh, it's important because Carnet makes a big deal about it, Quine makes a big deal about it, Popper makes a big deal about it, and I've made a big deal about it because I've said that, you know, the first half of the course was about people who think that what's special about science is its concepts, whereas the second part is about people who think what's special about science is its statements or propositions. So, um... um I mean, I'm not sure how to explain this more clearly than I feel like I already have, but maybe I haven't said this. I don't know. So, like, a proposition or a statement. So here's an example. All emeralds are green. It's something that could be true or false. Um, right? It's something you can assert. And then I can ask whether you're whether it's right or not, whether it's true or false. But it's it contains these pieces, emerald and green, and those are the concepts. So um, now, like, if I assert this, um, there's two questions you could ask me about it, so to speak. One is on the doctrinal side, as far as I asserted a proposition that's either true or false, you could say, well, prove, prove it to me. Prove it's true. I think it might be false. Can you prove that it's true? And this and this is where deduction might help. If I can deduce this statement from some other statement that you already agree is true, then I prove that it's true. Right? And in an axiomatization, um, we you know we start with certain statements that everyone is going to admit the axioms, certain statements or propositions, everyone's going to admit that those are true. And then we try to deduce all the others that we want to assert from those axioms that everyone admits are true, right? And that's, right, so that's what 
um, Carnap in the alcohol calls the deductive system. The deductive system starts with axioms. So we get we get the thing that we want to assert from the axioms by deduction. So the axioms also have to be propositions. They have to be things that could be true or false, but we're all agreeing that they're true. And then deduction transmits truth from the axioms to the, to the theorems. Um, but if I said all emeralds are green, you also could ask me, well, what do you mean by emerald? What do you mean by green? Right? So then you would be asking about the concepts that I introduced. And in that case, what might help would be definition. Right? Then I could say, well, an emerald is a blah, 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 blah. And if I can explain what an emerald is in terms of concepts that you already agree are meaningful, then I can answer that part of your question that way, the conceptual part of your question, or your conceptual question that way by definitions, right? And that's what Carnap says that the constructional system is for. Constructional system tells us the deductive system, but there is no deductive system in the alphabet, right? He just mentions that that's the other part of the project. The deductive system would tell us how to get all the true statements from the axioms. The constructional system tells us how to get all the meaningful concepts from the basic concepts, the primitive concepts. Right, so by definition, we can get from the primitive. From the primitive concepts to all the meaningful concepts, and the definition transmits meaning from the primitive concepts to the to everything else. Are there questions about that? This is a distinction that Carnap makes and Goodman and Quine and Popper all make this distinction. And Neurot too, I guess. And, and lots of other people. Like if you're in 100C, this is the distinction that Locke makes. Um, at, you know, like in book one of the essay, he starts by saying there are no innate principles. Principles would be a type of proposition or statements. He says there are no innate principles. And then one of the way he proves it is because he says principles, since they're propositions or statements, must be built out of ideas. So he would call these two things ideas rather than concepts. But it's the, it's the same distinction, right? And in book one of the essay, he says, one of his proofs that there's no innate principles says, well, there's no innate ideas, right? So if there's no innate ideas, since every proposition or statement must be made up out of ideas, that is concepts, um, there can't be any innate propositions. Okay. It may well be that that's, that was already clear to everyone who's here. There's not very many people here, so, uh, and that the other people who are confused are people who are watching the lections, the lections, got elections on the brain, the lectures <laughs> on, uh, on YouTube or, or not watching them at all or whatever, but I don't know. Anyway, um, Okay, so with that introduction, then I'm going to go back and say what I, what I said to begin with. So Popper says, 
It doesn't matter what concepts you use. What matters is whether you use them in statements or propositions that are falsifiable. Um, but, um, and this is the segue into strict versus numerical universality, the the problem that Goodman makes about empirical concepts, some version of that problem still turns up in Popper. So, I mean, it's a problem that from Goodman's point of view or Carnap's point of view would be a problem about which are good concepts. And, um, So like if you say, you know, um, all electrons have charge minus E. <laughs> um, Oh, there's glare on the whiteboard. Hold on. Um, this is a statement that you can build up evidence for. This is how Carnap and Goodman would see it, right? It's the inductivist account or justificationist account. This is a statement you can build up evidence for by examining one electron after another. And once you have enough evidence for it, um, you can predict that the next electron will also have charge minus E. Not with certainty, of course, but you have some justification for saying that. That's the justificationist account, and it's, um, um, of course, not what Popper will say about this statement, but, um, but Popper also will agree that this is a good type of statement of natural law. He'll just say the reason it's good is because it's falsifiable. Um, um, anyone I tell this to can check for themselves whether it's a good theory or not, by looking at electrons and, and trying to find one that doesn't have charge minus E. Um, I mean, you might ask, how do you know it's an electron if it doesn't have charge minus E? And that has to do with conventionalism, which is the next topic I'm going to talk about. So uh, never mind that. So you have some way of collecting electrons and you know, you find one that charges at minus E, you falsify the statement. Okay, but then, um, right, contrast it with this statement, all pens on my table are black. So here again, they're going to agree that there's something wrong with this statement. I mean, not wrong like you shouldn't say it or something, but it's not a good example of a scientific theory, right? So Carnap and Goodman will understand that in terms of induction, although, I mean, Goodman is the one who's pointing out that Carnap doesn't have a good way of telling between the two. But I understand it in terms of induction, right? Like, um, I can examine lots of pens on my table and find that they're black, but that doesn't justify me in thinking that if I bring a blue pen and put it on my table, it will become black. So, um, and Goodman assumes or assumes this is the right way to look at the problem for an inductivist. But the problem is with some of the concepts in this statement. In particular, it's with the, you know, the problem is with the concept pen on my table. Right? The two concepts here are electron and 
pounds charge minus E. The two concepts here are pen on my table and black. So black, we're assuming, isn't a problem, but pen on my table is the problem, right? That, as Goodwin would say, it's not projectable. If you collect lots of information about the pens on my table, it doesn't allow you to assert anything as a natural law. And therefore, it doesn't allow you to predict that if I bring another pen and put it on my table, it will be black. Um, right? And then, like, Goodman considers that you can tell considers the answer that you can tell that this is a not, pro not a projectable concept because it mentions a particular spatiotemporal region, my table, but uh, he rejects that. He says that won't work, and GRU is part of the argument to show it won't work, basically because you can't tell which concepts mention a particular spatiotemporal location and which don't. Okay, but so in any case, so that's, that's the problem for Carnap's type of view that Goodman is raising, but um, Popper also has a problem with this statement. So it's not going to be in terms of induction, but in terms of falsification, right? But, and here the problem is that if I say all pens on my table are black and you want to falsify it, you don't have my table. It's only here. <laughs> so you can't falsify it. So, so to you, it's unfalsifiable, right? And I guess you could travel here and get to my table and whatever, but, you know, my table has a limited lifetime, it, uh, you know, but you might find by the time you got here that I've already burnt up my table and you can't check this anymore. You know, or, I mean, I, again, like, I can make this worse by putting a time in here. All pens on my table between um, 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. on November the 12th, I think. Um, yes, on November 12th, 2020, are black. So, you know... After 2.30 p.m., no one can falsify it anymore. So, um, but Popper doesn't want to say the problem is with the concept because he wants to say it doesn't matter what concept he use. So instead, Popper says the problem is with the sense that all has in this proposition. <laughs> And that's the distinction between strict universality and numerical universality. This is the strict, Popper's analysis is that this is the strict universal. Strict universal, I mean, he doesn't say this in so many words, but I think this is the way he's thinking about it. Again, it's not an, it's not an issue of the concept, it's an issue of how you use the concept, basically. And this is strict universal quantification. You can't see the end of quantification, but that's what it says. All right, so this is strict universal quantification, whereas this is numerical. And I mean, so actually, in the original German, he called these specific and numerical. It's a uh, that terminology comes straight out of Aristotle: numerical identity versus specific identity. Um, um, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. I don't even know. I don't. I mean, 
Aristotle wouldn't use that as a name for two different kinds of universality. So, I mean, I think strict universal is fine to understand. Well, I mean, okay, maybe I should take that back. I'll say something more about that in a second. But anyway, I'm going to call it strict universal and numerically universal because that's what he says in English. So, right, and the, so the difference is that this uses the concepts to make a statement about what's true everywhere and always, whereas this uses concepts to say something about... Um, and this is a little bit ambiguous, but because he says both, I think, that it's a finite number of things and that they're in a spatio-temporally um, uh, limited position. So, um, I mean, of course, if there is a finite number of things, then they have to be in a spatio-temporally located position. Right, because you just like say there's five things. You just find the ones that are farthest apart. Um, for, you know, yeah, I'm not putting that very well, but you. Um, Yeah, I guess. You just find the ones that are farthest apart and you can draw a sphere that includes them and all the others. Um, but, um, but, the, but on the other hand, it's not necessarily true that things that are spatio-temporally local are, that there's a finite number of them, right? Because if they're, you know, just geometrical points or something, then there could be infinitely many of them. Um, um, it does make some difference maybe to how you understand this, but um, I think uh, for the reason I was saying that it's really the spatio-temporal locality that is the problem, and um, and the problem is, so like, how could this be fixed, you might ask, without taking away the concept pen on my table? Well, we would have to send, understand pen on my table as a universal type. And how do we do that? Well, I would have to understand my table to be a kind of table. Um, um, so in the case of my table, that's not very attractive. Why would I think of my table as a kind of table rather than as this particular table that's right in front of me? You can't see it, but it's there, believe me. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, I mean, you know something's got to hold up the computer, right? So... <laughs> There's, there's something there anyway. You don't know if it's a table. Um, so, um, uh, but the example uh, Popper uses is an, uh, of a concept like dog or swan, right? So, um, like, so strictly speaking, there's a lot of discussion about the species concept in philosophy of biology and in, to some extent, in biology itself. Um, but, like, strictly speaking, you know, what makes something a swan in the technical biological sense is partly that it's descended from a certain pair of animals. Right? So all the swans have some common ancestor that they don't share with anyone, any other animals. Now, I mean, that's, that's not the whole story, right? But that's part of the definition of swan. And, and just from the fact that that's part of the definition, you can already see that biologists are using the term swan the wrong way from Popper's point of 
And again, not the wrong way like he would tell them to stop doing it, but the wrong way for something like all swans are white to count as a strict universal. Because, you know, all the swans that are descended from some particular last common, all the animals that are descended from some particular last common animal are, well, there's both a finite number of them and they're spatio-temporally restricted. Right? Like, I mean, in this case, they're all on the earth. And they're all in the time between that last common ancestor and now. Um, so, like, all swans are white is not falsifiable for everyone. Because, for example, if uh, swans go extinct, um, or the earth is destroyed, then it will no longer be possible to check it. Swans go extinct and there's no record left of what color they were, I guess. You have to add some things to it. But, so, but on the other hand, if you use swan, and, um, and it may be that in everyday life we use these biological concepts more like this, I don't know. I mean, the issue doesn't usually come up or doesn't ever come up <laughs> and probably will never come up. But like if, well, I mean, so actually here's a way it could come up. Suppose science fiction and thought experiment, um, scientists learn how to synthesize an animal from its component molecules, right? So there's like an animal printer like a 3D printer that lays down layers of molecules. And when you're done, you have an animal. So question, could that be a swan or not? So I think that if it looked like a swan and it sounded like a swan and it acted like a swan and it mated with other swans and they had fertile offspring, et cetera, et cetera, most of us would say like scientists have created a swan scientists, engineers, whatever, who, the, the animal printing industry. <laughs> anyway, someone has created a swan. Is what, but, you know, according to that technical definition I gave, since this thing is not descended from that last common ancestor, it's not a swan. Um, so, but, you know, if we use swan that other way, then all swans are white is in principle falsifiable, right? Because even if swans go extinct and the earth is destroyed, you know, something just like a swan might be created on purpose or by accident somewhere else in the universe. And if that was happened, then someone there could check it to see if it was white. Um, right. So, I mean, that, that whole thing was just, again, to explain why Popper says the problem isn't with the concept. The problem is with the way you're using the concept to make a universal statement. If you intend, if you're using the concept in such a way that it could have instances anywhere, and again, he's thinking that of, as a matter of what this all means, then, um, um, you have a falsifiable statement and it's eligible to be proposed as a scientific theory. Um, whereas if you're using the concept to refer to something that would have to be in a certain region of space and time, then um, you're doing numerical universal quantification and you have something that... Um, Um, might be good for various purposes, might be good for various scientific purposes, right? So like in chapter four, all of this is from chapter three, but in chapter four, Popper says that um, if you wanted to falsify, if you wanted to get us to reject the theory that all ravens are black, assuming we hold that theory, Um, if you wanted to get us to reject the theory that all ravens are black, then uh, um, 
just a single observation isn't good enough, a stray observation. We need a falsifying hypothesis, but he says the falsifying hypothesis could be, for example, there's a family of white ravens living in Central Park in New York. So that obviously is an example of a numerical universal statement. So he's saying numerical universal statements are good as falsifying hypotheses to reject theories, but they're no good as theories. The scientific theories, and that's why this discussion is in chapter three about theories, the statements in the scientific theories have to be universal, but not this kind of universal. They have to be this kind of universal, strict universal. Okay. Whether um, this solves Goodman's problem, that is, um, um, whether Popper thinks we could tell by the way I use GRU that all emeralds are GRU is not a strict universal is not clear. I'm not sure exactly how he would make that out. Um, in other words, Goodman seems to show by the mutual definability of GRU and BLEEN versus blue and green that um, what using one set of concepts would be described as limiting my statement to a certain spatiotemporal region, right? So saying like all emeralds before X date are green um, and all emeralds after X date are blue. Um, from another point of view, looks like I'm using a strict universal. All, uni all emeralds everywhere and always are group. And sorry, I meant not after the date, but examined after a date. That's always important to remember that. But anyway, um, so, uh, um, Yeah, so I'm not sure what Popper's response to that is. I've, I've never seen Popper discuss Gru. I feel like he must somewhere in his voluminous writings, but I haven't seen it. Um, okay, are there any questions about that? Because if not, I'm going to go on to the new material. Okay. Um, you know, I see... I'm going to go on to the new material. There was another thing that was also left over at the end last time, but the other thing was conventionalism. And uh, fortunately, it uh, there's a lot about conventionalism in this in chapter four too. So I'm going to just discuss them together. Um, So what is conventionalism? Now, um, I guess you start with this, that everyone, or anyway, almost everyone, agrees that language is conventional. Now, I mean, there's different parts to that, but, I, but, but uh, in particular, the meaning of words is conventional. Right, so if I say something like, um, well, so I mean, so like the word cat. Why does it mean what it means in English? And the idea is it's because we all agree to use it to mean that. So we have an agreement or convention 
between us. Now, obviously, this wasn't a like explicit agreement where we all got together and drew up a document and signed it <laughs> that we're going to use cat for a certain purpose. But we all, in fact, agree to use the word cat to mean the same thing, namely cat. <laughs> right? That is, we use it to talk about cats. Uh, um, so, uh, um, I mean, when we describe this convention in English, it's always going to sound kind of funny because the word we use to describe it, at least in the simplest way, will just be the same word again. We use cat to mean cat. Well, um, but so now, suppose I say something like, um, I was going to say all cats have pointy ears, but maybe I should leave the all out. I mean, you know, when you say something like this, normally cats have pointy ears. You don't mean exactly for all x, x is a cat implies x has pointy ears. You mean something more like cats naturally have pointy ears. You know, I, you know, but in any case, so suppose I say cats have pointy ears. Right, in other words, you can't falsify this by cutting off the tip of a cat's ears, which you shouldn't do anyway, but I'm just saying. Maybe it's a necessary surgery you know, to help the cat. But anyway, it wouldn't also falsify the statement. So, um, so, uh, right, I guess, I mean, before going out, I just, I want to make this point even a little bit clearer, maybe, right? Cat means what it does because we all agreed to use it for that. There's nothing else about the word cat that makes it mean what it means. And if we all agreed to call them something else, then, you know, or if we all use the word, agreed to use the cat word cat to mean something else, then it could, it would mean that. So if we all agreed, suddenly started using it to mean what we now call a cow, then cat, this word would mean cow. I mean, that is, it would mean what we now call cow. <laughs> Right. So, um, so suppose I use this word to sit to say something like cats have pointy ears. Now, so there's two ways you could take my statement. And the second way is going to be the conventionalist way, whereas the first way is going to be the empiricist way, I guess I would put it. Right. So, um, So the empiricist way would be to say, um, assume this statement is true. Um, the empiricist will say, well, it's there's two parts to why it's true. And one part is conventional and the other isn't. So if this is an empirical statement, there's a conventional part and an empirical part. So there's, what I wrote there is, there's, well, this is not readable. You're probably like, what do you mean? Nothing you write is readable. Why do you just notice some words? But some of them look worse than others. Anyway, so there's an, I'm writing, what I wrote here is conventional empirical parts to why it's true. There's, right, so on the one hand, it's readable now. Yes, I hope. <laughs> okay, so, um, um, right, on the one hand, if we didn't have this agreement to use cats to mean what we agree, use the word cat to mean what we, in fact, use it for, then this statement might not be true, right? So, for example, cows, what we now call cows, don't have pointy ears. So if our agreement were to use the word cat to mean that kind of animal instead, 
then this statement wouldn't be true. So part of what makes it true is the convention we have for how to use the word cat. But the empiricist will also say, or the empirical understanding of this statement will also say, but in part it's true because of what's true about the world, right? What we can determine by experience, um, because those things that we agree to call cats actually have pointy ears. And therefore, on this way of understanding it as an empirical statement, you know, like first we have to settle that convention, but then once we've settled that convention, um, we can, and if you're Carnap, you'll say, we can go out and look for evidence for it. The convention is part of what tells us how to look for evidence for it. Um, or if you're popular, you say, we can go out and try to falsify it. And the convention is what tells us, you know, what we're going to try to falsify. Okay, but you can also look at this. as true only by convention. How would that work? Well, suppose you took this as a partial definition of the word cat, right? So you understood when I said cats have pointy ears that I was telling you in part what I mean by cat. Because, you know, remember, like, when I was trying to explain what the convention is, so it's not really helpful to say the convention is that we call cats, cats, <laughs> right? Like, that doesn't help you. If you didn't know what the convention was, you still wouldn't know. <laughs> but you might know what the convention was for these words have pointy and ears, and if you happen to know that, then this might help you to understand what we mean by cat, right? So I, you know, you would say like, okay, so what do English speakers mean by cat? Suppose you're learning English or whatever. Um, so you say, you know, what do English speakers mean by cat? And I start telling you stuff like, well, they have pointy ears, they're fluffy, they're cute, you know, they like fish, you know, all this stuff, right? So um, all of those things could be seen as explanations of what our convention is, right? As explanations of what we mean by the word cat. And if you took them that way, then there is no empirical part, right? So if you understood this as part of the definition of cat, and then I brought you an animal that didn't have pointy ears, you would say, it's not a cat that doesn't have pointy ears. Cats have pointy ears. Right, so if you're, so to be a conventionalist about this statement, cats have pointy ears, is to think that this statement only expresses our convention about the word cat. Doesn't, also say something about the world that could be justified or falsified, right? So again, like, I mean, it, it, both either Carnap or Popper would agree. So, right, Carnap would say, if you understand this just as a definition of cat, then um, it's analytic, um, right? It's true just by virtue of the meaning of the terms. And therefore, it's not something that you can or need to collect evidence for. And Popper will say, if you understand this just as a definition of the word cat, then it's not falsifiable. So they both agree, you know, if you understand it that way, it's not really a proper statement of scientific theory because the theories in the empirical sciences are supposed to be empirical. Okay, so, I mean, so far, like, um, um, so far there's no particularly serious problem for Popper, or, or, you know, I mean, 
you know, Popper will say, well, if you, you know, if you want this to be part of your scientific theory, then you should intend it the empirical way. Um, and that will be a decision about how to use the sentence. Um, so the problem is when we get to words that are a little bit more basic than cat, um, like line, point, force, I guess I could add also acceleration. Right, so right, these are terms that occur in the axioms of geometry, line and point. And these are terms that occur in laws of nature, at least, I mean, in the Newtonian laws of nature, which are not correct. They've been falsified according to Popper, but that doesn't mean that they're not, um, they weren't, good scientific theories in their time. On the contrary, you know, you can see from the fact that they actually have been falsified, that they were intended in a falsifiable way, and that shows that they were good scientific theories, basically, right? So, um, right, so Newtonian laws of nature, force and acceleration occur, right? So, a, you know, like a body in motion remains in motion, that is, doesn't accelerate, right? keeps, remains in constant motion unless acted on by an outside force. It was one of the Newtonian laws of motion. And um, so conventionalism, um, in the sense in which it's a philosophical issue, is the view that um, the axioms of geometry or the laws of physics, or something like that. But these are the two main issues here, um, and I'll say why in a second. The axioms of geometry and the Newtonian laws of motion, that those are not empirical, that they're part of the definition of these terms. So, like, um, Obviously, if that view is right, then Popper is in trouble um, because um, at least some of, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, paradigmatic scientific theories turn out not to be falsifiable. Um, and the conventionalists will tend to say, and this is true of all fundamental theories, right? So that they would, you know, uh, not just, they would say they're, they're all like that. And so, I mean, none of them are falsifiable. So Popper's criterion of demarcation is out the window. And by the way, the same thing would happen to Carnap. So um, why would they say that, though? So, um, so let me talk about geometry first, right? So you have the axioms of geometry and they contain concepts like line, right? So the axioms of geometry, again, are statements or propositions, right? They're, they're like cats have pointy ears, <laughs> only instead of the concept cat and the concept of having pointy ears, they have they contain concepts like line, point, um, um, and to use concept. When I talked about concepts, I didn't make a distinction between concepts and relations, the way Carnap sometimes does. But I'm thinking of relations also as a kind of concept, right? So, uh, like. Um, so the, the axioms of geometry use concepts like line, point, um, lies on, right? So that's a relation that can hold between a point and a line. 
um, uh, is between, right? So like one of the axioms of geometry will be something like, um, if three points all lie on the same line, then one must be between the other. It must be true in exactly one way that one is between the other two. Right, so that uses the concept of line, point, lies on, and between. And, um, you know, also another concept, uh, which is a relation that will figure in the axioms is like longer than. Right, when I, so I, you know, I could say that, like, you know, if point C lies between points A and B, then um, AB is longer than AC. Okay, so um, so that's what the axioms look like, and suppose we don't have any explicit definitions of those terms. Now, I mean, actually, Euclid in the Elements um, does define all kinds of terms like point and line, but by this time, most philosophers would agree that those definitions are not good definitions. They don't tell you anything really. Um, so when so, you know when. David Hilbert, uh, in the, I guess this was first in the very late 19th century, the first edition, published a new axiomization of Euclidean geometry. He did not include definitions of these primitive terms. I mean, right, this is why people thought those definitions in Euclid couldn't be any good, because there have to be some terms that are undefined, you know. So uh, there have to be some primitive terms, right? So I, 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 when I say he didn't define these primitive terms, I mean, he said, I'm taking these terms as primitive. I'm not going to try to define all my terms. That's impossible. So he started with a whole list of axioms using um, line, point, lies between, whatever. Um, but with, you know, so... Um, Starting from those axioms, you can then go on and prove certain things. Like, for example, you could prove that a line is the shortest path between two points. So at this point, it might seem like we have an empirical claim. Just go out and, you know, you can tell if it's true by just go out and find um, some points and measure different paths between them and see if any of them is shorter than the straight line segment, I guess, that lies between them. But the question is, you know, how do we tell that something is straight? And how do we tell whether something is longer than something else? Well, we need a ruler. You know, so like, here's our two paths. So I tell that this one is straight because I compare it to the ruler. And I see that it follows the edge of the ruler. And then I can tell that it's shorter than this one because let's say the ruler fits along it, you know, three times. Then I take the same ruler, and put it along this one, and I see that it fits more than three times. Therefore, this one is longer than this one. But wait, how do I know that this ruler is straight? And how do I know that it always stays the same length? I mean, because obviously if you have a curved ruler or if you have a ruler that let's say is made of metal and you change the temperature so it expands or contracts, um, then, you know, you could bring that ruler to this situation and you know, or one of the other of those things, you could bring those one of those rulers to this situation and use it to prove that 
the straight line is not the shortest path. So um, the conventionalist said, I mean, and see, the, the problem seems to be like we can't tell what those terms like. It's really the, the term straight line segment <laughs> or like segment of a line lying between two points. Um, we can't tell what that means um, without assuming that it applies to something. So the conventionalist is going to say, yeah, for sure, this is what's going on here. Um, that axiom that you thought was empirical that says, um, you know, a straight line segment is the shortest path between the two points on each end of it. Um, you thought that was an empirical statement, but it's actually part of a definition of the terms line, point, lies between, is on, etc. Um, and, uh, right, that is the axioms all put together are implicitly define the concepts or terms that they contain. There's no definition that says a line is blah, 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 but there's a bunch of axioms and the axioms are like cats have pointy ears. They're part of they're they're part of telling you how we use the term line. Um, but you know, because the axioms are stated in terms of primitives, um, the the axioms are all I can tell you about how we use them. Um, that is, or I mean, put it this like I. In the case of the cat has pointy ears, I assumed you already knew what has pointy ears meant. But in this case, you're going to have to learn what line, point, lies on, is between, what all those things mean just from the axioms without knowing what any of them meant before. So how is that going to work? Well, so basically what you learn is that um, part of what it means to say this is straight and always keeps the same length is that um, um, if you if you compare it to something else that's straight and always keeps the same length um, um, you'll find that this is true so anytime it looks like you find that it's not true, you say, well, either this wasn't straight or it changed its length or some combination of the two. Someone reminds me of Phil 100B about contingency, where if a prankster take the ruler, the companies use as reference to make rulers and cut it down, and all the rulers are shorter, and the rulers beforehand are wrong. Right. So I mean, it's yes, it's it's like, but I mean, um, but it's like this. It's like any time that that I brought a ruler to a line and you know used it to establish that this line was straight and then used it to establish that this line was shorter than this line um, and, um, and tried to do that but found, no, that it, this, it's straight but it's not shorter than this other one, which is not straight according to the same ruler, I would say, well, um, I wouldn't have to give an explanation that a prankster did it or something like that. I would say, by definition, This ruler is not a straight object that always stays the same length. 
And again, I mean, and again, it makes sense because it's like, it seems weird. It seems like, you know, but isn't that easily refutable by comparing it to other rulers or something? But the point is, you know, if there's no definition of what these terms mean other than the axioms, um, then any way we have of trying to determine whether something is straight, that is, whether it's a, a line segment or whether its edge is a line segment, and whether it stays the same length, that is, whether it's always the same line segment, um, or anyway, always congruent, congruent line segment, whatever, um, that, you know, any way we have of determining that is going to, in order to apply the concepts at all is going to rely on the axioms being true. So the axioms will always come out true. And similarly, I don't want to spend as much time on this, um, but, um, but similarly with force and acceleration, right? So like, you know, we want to say that a body doesn't accelerate unless it's acted on by a force. But on the one hand, how do we know whether a force is acting on a body? Like, how, how can you test whether there's a force acting somewhere? Well, you bring a body there and see if it accelerates. <laughs> there's no other test. <laughs> so, um, and on the other hand, how do you know that a body is accelerating? Well, um, you have to compare it to something that's not accelerating. This is what's called an inertial reference frame, you know, and you can think of the inertial reference frame as an actual frame work, right? Like it's a bunch of stuff, like little rods or something. Um, and if you know that your reference frame is inertial, that is that your reference frame itself is not accelerating, then you can tell whether other things are accelerating by seeing, you know, whether their velocity relative to this frame, and again, think of it as a physical frame, like made of rulers, you can see if their velocity relative to this frame is changing or not. Um, um, but how do you know that this one's velocity isn't changing? Well, basically, because, you know, it's not being acted on by a force. <laughs> that's, that's the only way you can tell, right? So, like, you know, for example, if you have, um, a bucket that's being swung around a pole on a string and you want to know um, is the bucket accelerating changing its velocity or or is the pole velo accelerating which one is going around the other so you know um, uh, you need to compare them to something that's not being swung around on a string. So no force is acting on it. So we know it's not accelerating. And then we can tell which one is accelerating relative to it. So, um, but you put these two things together and again, it starts to look like by definition, it will always be true that something's not accelerating unless it's being acted on by a force. So in any case where it looks like something's accelerating but not being acted on by a force, um, uh, we're gonna say either um, no, it's not really accelerating. You compared it to an accelerating reference frame, and that was your problem. Or, no, there's really a force, 
that you didn't know about and you can see because this thing is accelerating right so like you know if i let go of a test mass inside this bucket and it accelerates towards the bottom of the bucket looks like it's accelerating towards the bottom of the bucket so one of the things i can say is it looks like it's accelerating towards the bottom of the bucket because the bucket is not an inertial reference frame. The bucket is being accelerated around this pole. Right? So this is why people say, quote unquote, centrifugal force isn't really a force. Or it's what people sometimes call an inertial force. Um, it's but meaning it's not really a force. Um, it's not really a force. Uh, this thing is... Um, it's not that this thing is accelerating towards the bottom of the bucket. It's that the bottom of the bucket is accelerating towards the pole. And hopefully you've had some physics and you uh, understand why moving in a circle is accelerating towards the center, but if not, just believe me. <laughs> so, um, or you could say, um, no, uh, we've discovered that there's, there must be a force here. There's a special force that, right? And then you would be saying centrifugal force is a force. But you understand you always have both of those options, basically, or at least by some combination of them, you can always explain what looks like a violation of the law of inertia. Anything that looks like it violates the rule that bodies don't accelerate unless they're acted on by a force can always be explained by saying either that the, the frame of reference that you thought was inertial was actually accelerating or that the frame of, or that the, your, um, your list of forces wasn't complete. And the conventionalist, again, will say, and yes, that's how we use it. We have no explicit definition of these terms, force and acceleration. I mean, of course, you can, de you can define acceleration in terms of velocity, but that doesn't get you very far because then you have to define velocity. So um, uh, we have no explicit definition of these terms. All we have is certain laws of motion that relate them to each other, and those all put together an implicit definition of those terms. So that's conventionalism about geometry or physics. And I see I spent longer on that than I hoped I would, but um, are there questions about that so far? So, I mean, you can see two reasons. I mean, I, it's they're really two sides of the same coin, but you can, there's two ways you can say, see why this is so bad for Popper. Like on the one hand, obviously it means that the laws of physics or the axioms of geometry are not falsifiable if we accept the conventionalist view about them. Um, but um, also to put this in historical context, so, I mean, why did people become so interested in this towards the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century? Um, um, they were starting to worry about the effects that were, were going to eventually be explained by, and, you know, soon were explained by Einstein's theory of relativity. So, I mean, um, uh, the theory of special relativity says that the laws, the Newtonian laws of motion are false. And the theory of general relativity says that the axioms of Euclidean geometry are false. Um, so the conventionalist response, and I guess, I mean, as I said, like people started getting interested in this before Einstein actually published his theories, but I think it was because people had a feeling that's, 
the, you know, some of the earlier attempts to address these problems had started raising this thought in people's mind. I don't think it was a coincidence, but anyway, even if that's not true, certainly once Einstein published his theories, this became a very important issue because the conventionalist response to this would be, no, you cannot have proved that the axioms of geometry are false or that the laws of motion, are, Newtonian laws of motion are false because they're just conventions. So all you've proved is that we were calling the wrong things lines and points, or we were calling the wrong things forces and accelerations. But you can never prove that Newtonian mechanics or Euclidean geometry are false, because just as if what I meant by cat was partly that they have pointy ears, you could never prove to me that cats don't have pointy ears. Um, and that's also, that's bad from Popper's point of view because, um, um, it would, it would destroy the motivation for his criterion of demarcation. It wouldn't show that his criterion is false because the criterion of demarcation itself, remember, and this car, this popper agrees, is a, is a proposed convention. So it can't be shown to be false. It's, it's a suggested way to use the word science. So it can't be shown to be false. But if it turns out that um, Newton and Einstein are not um, don't fall within the demarcation, then um, it's not a good proposal. And Popper actually says that somewhere. I didn't, I didn't track down the quote again for this class, but it's in what it's it's in uh, this huge thick volume, the philosophy of Karl Popper. It's part of a series. Um, of the Schilp volumes, because they were edited by this guy Schilp, the philosophy of living philosophers, I guess. So, um, you know, and, and these, these volumes are interesting because people, you know, contributed um, articles, often articles critical of the person the volume was about. And then since it was a library of living philosophers, the person the volume was about would write replies to the, right? So replies to my critics. So, you know, at one point in those replies to his critics in that volume, Popper says, um, you know, in answer to the question, people are are always asking me, so what would give you to get, what would get you to give up your theory, Popper? Right now, we already said why that, like, if that means your theory isn't falsifiable, he never claimed it was falsifiable. He said it was conventional, right? That it, it wasn't a scientific theory. But, um, but he says, but you know what? I do have an answer for you, nevertheless. What would give me, get me to give up my theory? If it turned out that my criterion couldn't distinguish between Newton and Einstein on the one hand and Freud and 20th century Marxism on the other hand, then I would give it up because it would be no good for what I want to do with it. So Popper, you know, has to say something against conventionalism. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, I mean, he starts saying something against it in chapter three, where he looks at it as a view about how to define or, or how to use undefined primitive terms. Um, it's the view that the way we use undefined primitive terms is to treat the axioms as an implicit definition of them. Um, and then he comes back to it in chapter four where he um, treats it as an attack on the theory of that falsifiability is the criterion of demarcation. Um, And basically, his answer to both of them, and by now this shouldn't come as a surprise, is that 
the issue between him and the conventionalists is not uh, um, a question of who's right and who's wrong in a theoretical sense, that is, which one is true and which one is false. It's a question of who has the better proposal for how to use our axioms and, and statements of laws of nature. Right? So he says, you know, I mean, the only way of, there would be one way of showing that the conventionalist proposal is wrong if we could show that it's inconsistent with itself. But Popper says that it's not likely that that can be done. Um, so uh, I think you could show that it's impossible, not just not likely. But anyway, um, she says it's not likely that we can find a contradiction in conventionalism. And um, beyond that, there's nothing theoretical to say against it because it's not falsifiable. And my counterproposal, counter methodological counterproposal, is also not falsifiable. Because again, he agrees that what he's doing in this book is not empirical science and it's not falsifiable. And neither of them are falsifiable because it's really a practical question. Um, So like what he says about it in chapter four is relatively easy to understand. He just says that conventionalism will take the form of what he calls strategism, stratagems, that every time there's what looks like a falsifying result will instead adjust something else. Now, I mean, we could do this even without being conventionalists. So in a sense, this is something that he has to take on whether it's conventionalists or not. We could, you know, apply all these ad hoc hypotheses, um, redefine our terms, whatever, without having it conventionalist view um, as our reason for it. We could just be doing it because we're trying to hang on to our theory. Right? And so, like, one of the things we can do is treat the falsifying observations as fake news, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, but uh, if we're conventionalists, then we're always going to do one of these things. So that's why he calls them conventionalist stratagems. Because, you know, we're going to say that uh, you should always do one of these things because by definition, there isn't really falsifying evidence. Um, and so Popper's proposal is don't do that. <laughs> Now, I mean, he makes it a little bit more specific than that. Um, and I mean, but, but I mean, he, to some of the possible stratagems, he gives a pretty detailed response. And to others, he says, well, we just have to not do it. But I think the overall theme to his response is that whenever anyone proposes reacting to new observational statements by... Um, doing something to keep the theory by from being falsified by them. Um, and as, again, assuming, I'm going to come back to this in a second if I have time, but assuming that we're not dealing with just stray observational statements, right? This is another part of the Popper myth that Popper maintained that, you know, as soon as you have one observation that, contradicts a theory, you should throw it out. You should never adjust it. You should never say, oh, well, maybe that was a bad uh, measurement or, oh, wait, maybe there was a, you know, another body in the solar system we didn't know about or whatever. No, I mean, Popper says that, that I mean, where to draw the line is not so clear, but Popper says that, of course, well, you know, there's all kinds of noise in observations, and there also there are all kinds of, you know, assumptions, we background assumptions we might have made about the initial conditions or whatever that are wrong. So, you know, when you get a few falsifying observations, oftentimes that's the reasonable thing to do. But if you get a falsifying hypothesis, something that can be checked that's not just a stray thing that happened in one person's lab but it's you know so 
um, when you when you have something like that, and then someone proposes, well, no, let's not throw out the theory. Let's fix the theory using one of these stratagems. At that point, Popper says you should ask yourself, with this addition, will the theory get better? And by better, he means more falsifiable. <laughs> so, will the new theory? Treat yourself, treat the situation as if you were proposing a whole new theory and ask, would this whole new theory, which includes the ad hoc hypothesis or the claim that these observations are, are bad or that this observer is lying or whatever, like throw that all into your new theory? Now, I mean, it's not clear how to do that in some of those cases because they're not going to be strict universal statements. But anyway, that's what he says. This is part of the way Put we're going to see Putnam criticizing Popper. Um, but, you know, but that's what he says. He says, throw all that stuff into the theory and now ask yourself, the new theory, does it forbid more or forbid less than the old theory? So if it forbids less than the old theory, don't do it. If it forbids more, I'm not sure he says you have to do it. I mean, there may be other considerations, but anyway, it won't fall afoul of this rule. Um, I wish I could give a good example of this. He doesn't give an example. Um, but basically the point is that your, your new theory has to be something that would be welcome as a new theory. Um, so it has to be something that, um, a scientist might propose even without these falsifying observations, I guess is one way to look at it. Um, and as far as the definition thing goes, like, What's the recommendation here? I mean, what's the recommendation for how to solve the problem about the primitive terms not knowing they're being undefined and we don't know what they mean? I think what I think what Popper is thinking is, of course, we don't have a definition of them, but we do mean something by them. Um, Um, and we shouldn't change what we mean by them to, just to save our theory. Keep meaning the same thing we meant by them before. Now you might ask, well, how can we tell without a definition whether we mean the same thing by them as we meant before or not? And I think that, again, Popper would say, well, when you say, how can you tell whether you mean by the same thing by them? What you're asking, what you're really asking is something like, it's really a practical question. So, because what you're really asking is something like, what would force us in some situation? What about the meaning of the word would force us in some situation to say, um, um, uh, you know, oh no, the axioms have been falsified, rather than saying, that's not what I meant by lying. And I think the answer is, like, nothing, force, nothing physical forces us, and nothing logical forces us. It's methodology recommends that we not keep doing that. <laughs> um, so how can we, t it's not how can we tell, it's like how can we tell what, our, what we've resolved to do? How can we know what the maxim, as Kant would put it, what the supreme maxim of our will is in this case? And I think, you know, the answer is we, uh, you can't tell that. I think Popper and um, Kant would agree. You can't tell that. It's, you can't know whether you, uh, 
um, are willing to keep the rules of the methodology or not. <laughs> But from a practical standpoint, you are required to do it. Um, so, okay, so that went pretty deep pretty quickly. Um, but, I mean, I think that is the right depth here. Like, Popper, as we've already seen, more than Carnap, does actually see himself as, and certainly more than Quine, does actually see himself as inheriting something from Kant including this theoretical practical distinction. Um, and I think that's what it comes down to. This is basically an ethical issue and we you know we don't know whether we whether we how, whether our wills are good or not. Um, but we're required for you know we're commanded for them to be good. <laughs> um, uh, uh, like uh, the command is not given for the purpose of us feeling good about ourselves <laughs> and it can't be used for that it's given to tell us to be good <laughs> um, and this you know this practical issue you know I mean again Popper thinks this is closely tied to issues that we might, I think, like Carnap, I think, Popper thinks that these issues in philosophy of science, the issues in methodology of science, are really closely tied to the type of issues that we would normally recognize as ethical or political issues. Right, so again, remember what Popper's two main examples of pseudoscience are. Freudian psychoanalysis, you can't see my fingers when I do this, I hate it. Freudian psychoanalysis and 20th century Marxism. So um, um, I think just from those examples, you can see why Popper might think that the question of which methodology to adopt was a ethical question. Um, okay, how much time is left? Oops, very little time. Okay, well, that's all right, because in a sense, so there's a lot of other stuff in the chapter about um, falsification, which is the title of the chapter. Most of it I've already touched on in one way or another. Um, but I guess there's, I mean, there's one thing that has to really be, and, and, and most of the rest that I haven't touched on, although it's interesting and you can raise a lot of questions about Popper based on it, it's, you know, it's, which, I mean, the stuff I mean now is the stuff where he says, like, imagine that this circle contains all possible basic statements. And you know that every what he calls an occurrence is a point in this circle, and everything he calls an event is a line in this circle. And the circles around the center are like sets of coordinates or something like that. Right? Like it's a whole complicated metaphor and also a whole complicated definition of these terms like occurrence and event and whatever. Um, it, you know, there is a lot of interesting stuff in those details, but I don't think it's a tragedy if I don't talk about them in the lecture, and I don't think it's a tragedy if you don't understand them. Um, what is important in all that stuff is, I think, um, two things, but one of them I've already talked about quite a bit. Well, actually... But that's the one that comes second anyway. So let me say what the main one is, the main first one. So the, 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 the first one is the distinction between falsifiability and falsification. Now, I mean, number one, when I first started talking about Popper um, last week, uh, um, 
I emphasized right away that you shouldn't confuse falsifiability with falsification in the simple sense that you shouldn't think that when he says that all scientific theories have to be falsifiable, that he means they all have to be falsified. <laughs> um, right? I mean, once it's falsified, it's we don't accept it anymore. We consider it false. <laughs> um, so it better not be the case that all scientific theories have to be falsified. Um, that would mean we have to regard them all as false. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's that simple, but, you know, I mean, I've seen this confusion enough on exams and whatever that I think it's worth emphasizing. Um, but that's a simple type of confusion. But that that's, you know, I don't think it doesn't occur to Popper that someone is going to be confused about that. But what he is worried people will be confused about is the difference between the way he uses the basic statements. So the basic statements are like the protocol sentences, the observational sentences. Next chapter is going to be all about that. So I won't say anything more about them. But... Um, uh, so he uses basic statements both to explain what it means that a theory is falsifiable and to explain what it means that a theory is falsified. But he doesn't use the same basic statements in the same way. So when you ask whether a theory is falsifiable, let me... We ask whether the theory is falsifiable. We're asking whether the theory rules out some possible basic statements. Now, um, in order to check for that, you have to first agree not to accept this conventionalist methodology. Because in the conventionalist methodology, no theories are falsifiable. They still imply basic statements, but those basic statements can't be false because they're consequences of the definition. So they imply basic statements, but they, the, the basic statements are not possible. The possible basic statements are not possible falsifiers, according to a conventionalist. But Popper says once we make the right metaphological decision, then we can examine the theory and see. Does it rule out any possible basic statements? And basically, we already know how that works and what that means, right? The theory contains some universal, um, strict universal laws. And, you know, it implies some singular statements given some other statements about the boundary conditions. So, um, so, um, there's some basic statement that consists of like a conjunction of those boundary conditions and the negation of the prediction that um, is inconsistent with the theory. Right, so the theory, you know, given that I released the ball, you know, at this height with this velocity, the theory predicts at a certain time it will be in a certain place and moving at a certain velocity. Um, so, you know, the statement that I released it with that, um, at that time, at that height, with that velocity, and at that other time, it wasn't in that place, moving at that velocity, um, is inconsistent with the theory. Okay, I see we're out of time, but uh, so I, I think again I'm going to leave this over till next time. But again, maybe it's not that bad because we're talking about basic statements next time. So I'll just say, so you might think fault the theory is falsified if it rules out any actual basic statements. <laughs> <laughs>
But that, again, would be the view that any time any observation contradicts your theory, you throw out the theory. So, right, instead, falsified, Popper says, so falsified uses the actual accepted basic statements, not all possible basic statements, but it doesn't use them in such a simple way, he says. On the contrary, it's a, it can be a complicated decision when to regard the theory as falsified. There have to be some falsifying basic statements, obviously, or right? we couldn't regard it as falsified, but it's a complicated methodological question, how many and what type there should be, and so on and so forth, before we regard the theory as rejected, falsified. And so this is not a logical, this is a logical property of the theory, that it rules out some possible basic statements, this is basically a, like a political decision we have to make, the scientific community, on methodological grounds, which as I just said are, are basically ethical or political grounds, whether the time has come to give up this theory. And it uses those actual basic statements, but it can't just be logically cranked out of them. Okay, and that's all and more than I have time for, so I will see you next week. Bye.